Good afternoon. My name is Robert Lamb. I'm the director of the Program on Crisis, Conflict, and Cooperation here at CSIS. Uh, thank you all for being here today, and welcome to those of you who are uh, watching it live uh, through the CSIS website and through the Hive. Uh, welcome to all of you. Um, CSIS, uh, for a number of years, has has been hosting the launch of the Global Peace Index uh, on the Western Hemisphere. As many of you know, the Institute for Economics and Peace, um, which works pretty closely with the Economist Intelligence Unit, has been launching its Global Peace Index simultaneously in Washington and London every year. Uh, and it's been CSIS's pleasure to be the, uh, the host of the Western Hemisphere launch. Um, uh, the, uh, the role of a think tank such as CSIS has always been to connect the, uh, the world of data and research to the world of policy, and CSIS has been doing that for 51 years now. And the Institute for Economics and Peace uh, operates very firmly in the world of research, in the world of data, and as you'll see, they have taken the uh, the best data that is available in the world today, and they've done a great deal of analysis, a uh, great deal of visualization uh, to try to interpret what some of the big, most important trends are regarding peace and violence and conflict in the world today. Uh, my program, uh, the Program on Crisis, Conflict, and Cooperation, known as C3, has been studying uh, the issues that IEP and the Global in Peace Index deals with for the past 12 years. And I want to say just a quick word uh, about translating uh, scholarly research and data analysis into policy. Um, of course, one of the things that data and research can tell you are, uh, are uh, general trends, sometimes very specific trends uh, about data. Um, uh, they can give you theories. It can give you patterns. But policymakers are responsible not for making policy on the general case um, or on broad trends. They're responsible for making policy in very specific places at very specific times. And so uh, we'll see today a great deal of, of uh, really excellent research showing the relationship between peace and conflict and peacefulness um, and a wide variety of patterns in the world. Uh, for example, institutional development. Um, countries with strong institutions tend to be more peaceful. But for the policymaker, what they don't know is, um, you know, is a particular country they're working on, do you have to uh, start with removing violence before you can build institutions? Can you start with building institutions um, to take care of violence? Is it possible to do both simultaneously, um, to work on everything at once? Um, or do you need to find uh, small areas where you can make incremental progress in some areas to win a little bit of space on violence to then win a little bit more freedom uh, to improve institutional development and so on in a, in a um, virtuous cycle? Um, and that's where policy research comes in to try to interpret this. There are some countries that will uh, improve uh, on peace with less institutional development, some who have had a great deal of institutional development but less, um, but less peace. But the general trend, the general pattern is extremely important to observe that places that have strong institutions do generally tend to be more peaceful. Um, it's up to all of us in the policy community to now take that information and that data and turn it into good policy. Um, that's a great challenge, but it's one that we, uh, that we all relish. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Michelle Breslauer, who is um, the, the head of the U.S. programs for the Institute for Economics and Peace. Um, she is going to present the basic results um, of the Global Peace Index. And then we have um, a, a lot of great speakers who will um, go into greater detail of the findings and, um, and discuss their view and interpretation of, um, of what it all means. And I will introduce each speaker in turn. There are detailed biographies of everybody who's up here. Um, and um, I encourage you to look at them um, so that I don't have to go in great detail about their backgrounds. Uh, but it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Michelle Breslauer. Thanks, Bob. And thanks to all the panelists, everybody who came out here today. I'm not going to speak for too long, because then I'm going to hand it over 
to my colleague, Danielle Hislop, who's going to go into more detail about some of the analysis that we're doing, some of the work that Bob mentioned. I also want to point out that Jamie Morgan is here from the Economist Intelligence Unit. They're one of our partners on the index, and she's available to answer any questions that you guys might have in more detail about the methodology or the data. So the Institute for Economics and Peace produces the Global Peace Index, and our mission is really to measure, identify the drivers, and ascribe an economic value to peace. We want to strip peace of its utopian connotations, and we want to make it a tangible measure of progress and well-being. So first, it's important to understand how we define peace to do this. We look at a conceptual framework of negative and positive peace. Negative peace is the foundation of the Global Peace Index. The definition of the GPI is the absence of violence or absence of fear of violence. And this is meant to go beyond the thinking of interstate violence, but that the absence of violence affects people's everyday lives, their security, the way that they live them. But negative peace doesn't tell you about what it takes to make or sustain a peaceful society. So for that, we start to look at positive peace. And that's the attitudes, institutions, and structures that lead to mutual cooperation and benefit and help society move away from violence. So negative peace is sort of measuring what we don't want, while positive peace is more about measuring what we do want. So I'm going to give you the quick results from this year's Global Peace Index on the negative peace side, and Daniel will tell you about the positive peace index. There are three groups involved in the Global Peace Index, the Institute for Economics and Peace, the Economist Intelligence Unit, and an independent expert panel. They provide peer review of the results and the methodology so that we can make sure that the process is independent. We look at 22 indicators, both internal and external to a nation, ranging from measures of ongoing conflict, of which there are five, societal safety and security, and militarization. So when we take these indicators, what have we found in the last year? The 2013 Global Peace Index shows that peace has had a slight deterioration in the last year, and really the trend driving this was an increase in homicides and deaths from internal organized conflict. Internal organized conflict, you should note, has been driven by 70 deaths in Syria, but also by continued deaths, for instance, in Mexico's drug war. So in the last year, the drug war in Mexico has claimed twice as many lives as the conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. And this has actually been a continuing trend that Daniel's going to elaborate on. When we map the results of the index, this is what it looks like. And you can go to our website, visionofhumanity.org. We have interactive maps where you can look at each country by indicator and year and see the, all of the data associated with each country. Green is more peaceful, red is less. And one thing to notice is that there's quite a big, big regional spread and differentiation. Uh, this past year, the Middle East and North Africa has been the region that has decreased the most in peace. The top 10 most peaceful countries, and I show this first because we hope to also focus on these countries and understand what we can learn from them, led by Iceland once again. What's interesting here in the top 10 is that once you're in the top 10, you tend to stay there. There is a certain resiliency of the nations in the top 10. Japan, for instance, dropped out of the top 10 briefly after the tsunami, but has regained its position. Now, looking at the least peaceful countries, Afghanistan is actually the least peaceful country this year. The list uh, goes down in the opposite order. And once again, the countries here have also been pretty much here since the index was first launched in 2007, and they tend to stay there. Seven of the 10 scores have deteriorated. In Afghanistan, it's less peaceful now in the 2013 index than it was in 2008, so less peaceful than Iraq was in 2008. Looking at the United States, where we are now, we're 99th on the index. Some might presume that our involvement in international conflicts, militarization, are the only reasons that the United States scores the way that it does. But it must be noted that our high incarceration rates, high homicides, 
availability of small arms also affect the U.S. score and hold it down. These are the year's top rising nations and uh, fallers. In the risers, we see a pattern each year, Libya, Sudan, and Chad. They're always countries that are emerging from conflict, and the biggest fallers tend to be the ones that are experiencing open armed conflict. These are the indicators that have improved this year. Likelihood of violent demonstrations has gone down. There's been a slight calming of the situation in Europe and in Arab Spring countries. Negative indicators, once again, homicides. Uh, Honduras has the highest homicide rate in the, in the world, and that increased by 10 this past year. Military spending fell for the first time since 2008 in total terms, but a greater number of countries increased their expenditure as a percentage of GDP. So when we look at the impact, we know that there is a social impact of violence, but there's also an economic impact. And each year, the Institute for Economics and Peace looks at defining what that is for the year. What is the economic impact of violence? We found that in 2012, it was over $9 trillion, which is about 11% of world GDP. This is what we are terming violence containment spending, and it's the economic activity related to the consequences or prevention of violence. Now, the report has a very detailed methodology on this that uh, you can look through, so I'm not going to go through it, but it ranges by country from North Korea, where 20% of GDP is spent on violence containment, to Iceland, where 1% 1 of GDP is spent on violence containment. But what does this mean in real terms? One year of violence containment spending is 75 times official development assistance. It means that each day we're spending $25 billion, $1,300 per person per year, so one year of this spending could almost pay off the total U.S. government debt. And more realistically, just a 1% reduction in this would fund the additional amount required to achieve the Millennium Development Goals, which is $60 billion per year. And we see that this violence containment industry is actually bigger than the world tourism sector, bigger than the agricultural sector. So it's a really useful way to illustrate not only the social imperative, but the economic imperative of peace. And I'm gonna wrap it up here and let Daniel give you some more information about the trends we've identified, as well as the links that we see between peace, resilience, and vulnerability. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel Hislop is the research director of the Institute for Economics and Peace. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, that's better. Uh, sorry, I don't know if anyone heard me then. Um, I'm going to start by recapping uh, what the GPI data tells us uh, about trends in violence. Uh, I think that's important because uh, the GPI measures violence in many different ways. It measures interpersonal violence, it measures collective violence, it measures armed conflict, uh, internal and external forms of violence. So. By understanding those trends and what types of violence are the most important, we can, it's really a first step uh, to understanding the drivers of violence, and that's what this research project is really about. By understanding drivers, we can begin to understand uh, you know, what are the potential uh, drivers of resilience. So looking at our six-year trends, uh, what you can see here is, is uh, there has been a 5% uh, reduction in the level of peacefulness, the GPI score has, has gone down. Uh, many countries have improved, uh, but many have gone down as well, and the deteriorations have outweighed the gains. One of the main reasons for the, the overall fall, and uh, Michelle alluded to a, a few of these, is the fall in internal indicators. Uh, the measures of safety and security, homicide, uh, violent crime, uh, the level of incarceration, the number of police, 
those have been the indicators that have really fallen in the last six years globally. The external indicators have also fallen, um, and, but just to a much uh, lesser extent. When we look at the distribution of GPI scores, uh, we see a, a really key trend, and it basically shows that peace is becoming more unequal. Uh, the countries at the bottom of the index, the bottom 15 to 20, you can see uh, are sort of separated now from the rest of the, the, the distribution. In 2008, uh, it was a, a more even uh, distribution. You've now got that, that bottom 10 really separated. And as Michelle said, uh, countries like Afghanistan uh, and Iraq are less peaceful than they were in 2008. At the top of the index, you've also got uh, a, a split in the distribution. Um, so those countries at the top are, are moving away. Regionally, uh, the Middle East and North Africa uh, has decreased the most, mostly due to the Arab Spring, uh, but South Asia is still the least peaceful region. And I think it's important to note that Russia and Eurasia, the, the Commonwealth independent states, uh, are actually uh, less peaceful on average than Sub-Saharan Africa as a region. I think one of the more striking trends about the uh, quantitative data uh, in the GPI uh, this year is the increase in global homicides. Um, when we look at uh, the UNODC data that we use, we can see that there's been a sustained increase, and it's quite a big increase. And if we go back to uh, 2000, that trend has, has actually uh, been continuing. The really important thing to note about this is that uh, regionally it's quite unequally distributed. Uh, Central America uh, and Caribbean, South America and Sub-Saharan Africa have all seen a, a gradual increase, uh, but the rest of the world uh, has, has remained more or less the same. And uh, that follows a pretty well-established trend that, that, that we're aware of in the US and the UK. We've, we've seen declining homicide rates and certainly in parts of uh, Europe, but it's not the case in many other parts of the world. Uh, in the Global uh, Peace Index, we measure terrorism via our Global Terrorism Index, and that takes account of the number of deaths from terrorism, the number of injuries, uh, and the level of property damage uh, that occurs from terrorism. And that's also increased since 2002. Uh, it peaked in 2007. Uh, the, the main reason for that was uh, Iraq, the height of uh, Iraq's sectarian violence. And at that stage, Iraq accounted for about 50% of the global total of terrorism. Uh, whilst Iraq has improved, uh, several other countries, uh, Afghanistan, uh, India, uh, uh, Nigeria, have actually increased in their levels of terrorism. And it's really important to note that this is mostly domestic terrorism. Uh, the great majority of this is, is by domestic actors. The other thing to, to note is that armed conflict deaths, the number of deaths from organised internal conflict has also increased. Uh, so from 2007 to 2012, the average uh, was about 111,000. Uh, the previous four years, it was, it was about 52,000, so it's a significant increase. It's not just because of what's happened in Syria, uh, although Syria has accounted for a great majority of the increase in deaths in 2012, it's also because many other countries have seen quite large increases. In 2007, there were only five countries that had more than 2,000 uh, armed conflict deaths. In 2012, there's, there's 11. So the breadth and intensity of armed conflict deaths has increased. Also, uh, it's important uh, that uh, we note that homicide uh, still is the main way that people die uh, in a violent death. Uh, criminal violence really is the main, the main uh, I guess, uh, indicator that we need to look at when we're looking at violent deaths. Uh, so just when we cap off those, those trends, I, I think there's three really key takeaways. Uh, one, we've seen this increase in internal violence, those safety and security uh, metrics really deteriorating. Two, an inequality in the level of peace, so those bottom ten really becoming less peaceful. And three, the magnitudes of those decreases outweighing the improvements. And whilst these trends are, are useful and they're, they're important to tell us about short-term 
progress. Uh, they don't really tell us much about long-term institution building and, and resilience building. And uh, while the GPI is very good at that short-term uh, progress, it doesn't tell us anything about the institutions. What it does provide us with is a statistical base which we can use to analyse violence, a multi-dimensional measure of violence against many other uh, metrics. And what we did is uh, take the GPI and essentially analyse it statistically with many other cross-country data sets and we came up with this framework called the Pillars of Peace um, which is meant to be a starting point for us to think about the key attitudes, institutions and structures which help sustain a more peaceful society. Uh, they're things that perhaps are not that surprising, uh, you know, well-functioning govern government, uh, sound business environment, uh, the free flow of information, uh, low levels of corruption. Uh, acceptance of the rights of others is really trying to uh, look at uh, informal norms of uh, trust and tolerance between different ethnic, religious uh, groups. Uh, high levels of human capital is uh, referring to uh, the standard of education in a country, but also levels of youth development, and good relations with neighbours, which is trying to measure uh, social capital and uh, norms of trust between not just citizens, but also between uh, states. Uh, and equitable distribution of resources refers not just to income inequality, but also to uh, the equi equitable access to uh, health and education. And the, the really key thing that we like to emphasise about this framework is that uh, these factors are interrelated. We need to think about them in an interrelated manner. Uh, if you have a deficit in one of the pillars, that has the potential to undermine other pillars. Uh, we're not trying to say that A equals B in terms of causality. Uh, what this is trying to emphasise is that the factors are interdependent. Causality can go both ways. Uh, and it really does depend on the, the, the country context and the circumstances in a country as to which factors will be more important. So what we've done with that framework is to then try and build a measure out of it, as we do. <laughs> and uh, we've called this the Positive Peace Index. Uh, it's essentially 24 indicators, uh, which have all been empirically derived by their, their correlation to the GPI. Uh, this is really trying to be a multi-dimensional measure of institutional capacity. Uh, <clears throat> the really important thing is, is that it, it counts formal and informal institutions, uh, and we're really trying to capture positive states as opposed to negative states. So we're trying to measure the things that we want, not the things that we don't want. And what we do when we do that exercise is we get uh, a measure, a single number, that measures institutional capacity. Uh, and it's really a proxy for thinking about resilience against external economic, political, environmental shocks. Uh, I think uh, there's a few things that we, we learn from this exercise. Uh, obviously, the, the, the darker blue countries are the countries with more positive peace. They have more resilience. Uh, but what we see when we track this data, and we've done it now with 10 years worth of data, is that these institutions move very slowly over time. Uh, from 2005 to 2010, there was only a 1.7% 1 uh, 1 change. Uh, so they really do move slowly. And once you have them, it's, it's both very hard to get rid of them, but it's also very hard to build them up. Uh, the other thing to note about this is that there are a lot of countries that you can see that are grey. Uh, the data just doesn't exist, and it's a real challenge uh, to measure uh, institutional capacity at a, a national level uh, with the current stock of data. It just doesn't, it's just not there, especially in formal institutions. Now, what I want to quickly show is how we can think about this, how we can think about the relationship between violence and positive peace. And uh, basically, what we see in this scatter plot is the countries on the the bottom left uh, are those that are peaceful, uh, that have institutional capacity. Uh, those countries, it's probably not surprising that a lot of them are Western European. Uh, you know, they tend to be higher income. Uh, they, they tend to be uh, you know, with full uh, 
democratic governance structures. Uh, although it is important to note there are some exceptions. You've got countries like Qatar and Singapore, which are hybrid regimes, very close to the, the blue area. And essentially, uh, those countries are more peaceful and they tend to have uh, more equitable distribution of resources. They tend to have lower levels of corruption. They tend to have better business environments uh, and all the other pillars that make up a more peaceful society. On the top right, uh, those countries are both violent and uh, vulnerable. Uh, they are the countries that really uh, have a risk of falling into a vicious cycle of conflict and fragility. And um, I think uh, one thing to note, when we look at the change in these metri uh, metrics over time, is that uh, positive peace is a, is a really good uh, proxy for vulnerability. So what we see on this particular graph is that the longer the arrow, the bigger the change in peace. So the red arrows show a country really falling into conflict. Uh, and the important thing to, to see is that uh, countries up until about 40th in both indexes see very little change relatively. Uh, it's, it's after that that you then tend to see quite a lot of movement. And in 2008, uh, some of the biggest falls in the GPI, some of the countries that experienced the, the most amount of violence in the last six years, had quite big positive peace deficits. Uh, Syria, uh, Rwanda, Madagascar and Egypt all fell quite a lot on the, on the GPI. I think one of the challenges uh, for us when we're thinking about development is uh, the balance between the long-term and short-term humanitarian assistance. Uh, there is no correlation really between positive peace measures and ODAs. Uh, similarly, there's not really a correlation between a change in ODAs and a change in peace. Oh, sorry. <laughs> ODAs uh, stand for Official Development Assistance. Uh, so uh, what we see is, is, is actually uh, uh, many countries uh, which have fallen on the GPI, have become more violent, uh, have also experienced an ODA shock, which, which basically means they've received more than, or less than 15% of their ODAs in, in, a, in a previous year. Uh, so I'm just going to get to the final slide uh, and really come back to the, the main point of uh, the exercise and, and the presentation, which is to emphasize that peace and violence is an important measure of human well-being and progress, um, and to show uh, the, the relationship between violence, uh, peace, uh, the Millennium Development Goals, and other development metrics. What we see here is Countries that are higher on the Global Peace Index, that are more peaceful, tend to have higher MDG achievement. And this was really uh, soundly established in the World Development Report in 2011. Uh, we, we know that conflict uh, has a really big, uh, important uh, influence on development. And as Michelle sort of mentioned about uh, the economic costings, it, it, it is uh, critical to highlight that it's not only low-income countries that suffer from violence economically. It's also middle and high income countries like the US. And I think going forward, one of the real challenges will be to develop better data to measure these things and to develop more frameworks and better frameworks to think about resilience uh, in, in the future. So I think with there, I'll leave my comments and maybe move to the panel. Thanks. Thanks very much, Daniel. Um, uh, and uh, thank you, Michelle, as well, for that, uh, that uh, extra excellent and brief summary of um, a very uh, long and detailed report, um, which I believe uh, all of you have on your chairs there. And those of you watching uh, through the internet uh, can obviously download from the Institute of Economics and Peace website. Um, uh, we have a distinguished panel of discussants um, to offer some brief thoughts uh, about the results of the 2013 Global Peace Index, uh, beginning with Alejandro Ponce. Um, Dr. Ponce is the Chief Research Officer at the World Justice Project, and as such as the, uh, the co-author of the uh, World Justice Project's Rule of Law Index, so he's not unfamiliar with the, uh, the world of data analysis and linking it to policy. Um, he's a former economist at the World Bank, um, and he's going to offer some brief comments about the the uh, 2013 Global Peace Index. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, 
Thank you very much for the invitation. First of all, I would like to <coughs> congratulate the Institute for Economics and Peace and the, the authors in particular uh, for producing this report. Um, I have been on the other side and producing uh, the World Justice uh, Project Rule of Law Index report, and I know the enormous amount of work that is behind each one of the numbers and each one of the sentences and so on, so uh, congratulations on, on a very good work. Uh, I would like to, my, my remarks are basically going to be uh, just from, from the perspective of, of building indicators, and I will touch a little bit on the results, but mainly on on how I see the contribution of this report into the field. And just first of all, in order to um, have impact with this kind of, of reports, I think there are three very important things or three basic things that reports have to have. They have to be serious, they have to be objective, and they have to be easy to understand or just or to visualize. And I think this report has uh, these three characteristics. Um, so just, I think there are three reasons why I think this report is important. The first one, which I found it extremely interesting, is the framework that has been developed during the last few years and that make up this, this index. Uh, the framework is not only, it allows us to understand violence and how it affects people. So when I first first read it, I, I, I noticed that it's not only about conflict that some of us sometimes think about when we talk when we talk about peace, that is about conflict. No, it's not only about conflict. It's about crime. It's about political violence. So it allows us to really understand violence in a comprehensive way. Uh, the report also provides a very interesting exercise on the cost of violence which I actually just, being a methodological geek, I went to check the methodology and so on, and it's, it's very interesting how it is built, and what is most interesting, I think, is that uh, it does the exercise for a large number of countries. So takes just the basic framework of the GPI and goes a little bit deeper trying to, to understand uh, what would be the cost of all these things that we see, why they matter and how much they cost to us. Um, and I, I, I think the, 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 the numbers are, are very, very interesting. The third part is that they actually look, uh, just what Daniel was presenting, they, they try to look a little bit further into the determinants of peace. And I think this is a, an extremely difficult exercise. So I think what they do is just simply putting the, the first piece, just opening the road, f because this is extremely, uh, just country specific, just indicator specific. Uh, I think something that, that Daniel mentioned and that is explained very well in the report is that the way to look at this is as a system and they make an analogy uh, as a forest in which there are trees, there are animals, there are fauna and so on and, and all of them interrelate into an environment. So it's a, it's a very interesting way to think about this but obviously really to, to go a little bit deeper and, and really think about risk assessments or how vulnerable is a country, it will require much more deeper studies on each one of the components uh, at, at the country level. The second part that I find very interesting is that it provides obviously assessments you know, that, that allow us just to, uh, just to see how countries are in a given point in time as well as monitoring progress. Something that I found very interesting is that uh, it's multidimensional. It's not only simply a hidden number that nobody knows how, 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 it's, how it's obtained. But uh, when talking about the country, describing the countries, the fact that there are many different dimensions allow us to, to see for each one of the countries what is really determining each one of the, uh, the, the rankings that they have. So that's, I found extremely, extremely interesting. Uh, today in the morning, I remember I opened the newspaper in Mexico, Reforma, and it was in, in the cover page just the, the, uh, the index, and I, I read the article, and it really just uh, touches a lot of the issues that, it's, that are happening in Mexico. Uh, the third one, I think, which is probably most important to, to, to us as an audience, is that it gives voice, really, this kind of report, provides a tool, really, and gives voice to victims, so which is really why we care about these kind of things, right? It gives an extra tool to practitioners and a voice uh, to victims, indicators in general can be very powerful because they they can 
uh, make accountable the different stakeholders. So with the different constituencies, it can be international constituencies, just uh, donors, or it can be local constituencies, which are probably the most important ones. So that I think uh, indicators in general, just providing a very simplified framework, uh, just tools for the civil society and the different uh, uh, stakeholders to, to, uh, to uh, sustain accountability. Finally, I think that the report is, is very timely, just given the trends that we, that we just saw uh, on deteriorating uh, peace, uh, I think we're at the right moment just to, to see something. I think the analysis that they did on, on just the different trends during the last five years and the different determinants, I think it, it's, it's very timely. Uh, just obviously there are issues that are not touched because they are complicated, just spillover effects around different countries and so on. But I think the report is extremely timely on on, on, on the situations. In, in general, it gives us uh, ways to identify weaknesses, monitor change, and ultimately just find ways to, to advance peace uh, just in conjunction with economic development and, and the advancement of the rule of law. Thank you very much. Um, our next discussant is, uh, is Mike Lofgren. Um, he was, uh, for 28 years, a, a professional staff member of the U.S. Congress, um, uh, most recently um, with the Senate Budget Committee. Um, uh, he uh, has a great deal of experience on the relationship between um, budgeting and national security, um, and as such is, is uh, clearly qualified to speak on the issue of the relationship between peace and economics. Uh, he's also author of The Party is Over, How Republicans Went Crazy, Democrats Became Useless, and the Middle Class Got Shafted. CSIS being a nonpartisan institution takes no position on that book or its title, um, but we're certainly glad to have uh, Mr. Lofgren here. Thank you very much. And now, as the uh, saying goes, for something completely different. Uh, my involvement with this project goes all the way back to about last Thursday, um, so forgive me for that. However, I will try to uh, make it relevant uh, with subject matter torn, as it were, from today's headlines. I appreciate the opportunity to comment on the Global Peace Index. The fact that I'm an American born and raised in the Midwest will hopefully excuse the rather parochial emphasis on my remarks today and my possible failure to encompass the international scope of the report. But it was eye-opening to see that the United States, Lincoln's last best hope for mankind, scored 99th out of 162 ranked countries on the index of peacefulness. That's in the 39th percentile. I calculate that the U.S. ranks 31 among the 34 countries of the OECD. The report says the U.S. has improved since the previous ranking, putting us one notch above China. That's really something to celebrate, isn't it? <laughs> among the bottom 10 countries, no fewer than five, Yemen, Pakistan, Iraq, Somalia, and Afghanistan are experiencing or have recently experienced U.S. military action. Certainly none of these countries was comparable to Switzerland before the U.S. intervened, but hopes that intervention might apply a soothing balm of peacefulness do not appear fulfilled either. Samantha Power, please take note. The United States, and I'm being totally serious, is the driver of the international system. Its example matters crucially. It also appears worth noting that the permanent five U.S. Uh, United Nations Security Council members are not exactly models. Their average score is 90, which would put them collectively ahead of the U.S., but still in the lower half of the 162 ranked countries. This may give us a clue as to why the U.N. does not work very well in averting conflicts. As to the methodology of the report, I have no quarrels. I would point out, uh, adverting to headlines, that physical violence in a state of peace, at least as I think the report defines a state of peace, are not always diametric opposites. A better way to put it is that an absence of physical violence is a necessary but not sufficient condition for a state of peace. Other qualities must be present before one sees the social climate that exists among the top 10 countries. 
for there can be little violent crime in a country and minimal overt physical brutality by the authorities, and one can still have a condition that is the opposite of social peace. With the dizzying advance of technology, coercive control of populations through physical violence may become a thing of the past, at least in technologically advanced countries. Now imagine, if you will, a nation where every electronic trace of every individual is collected and archived for potential future use. The National Security Agency is constructing a $2 billion data storage facility in Utah due to open in a few months that can store the equivalent of 500 quintillion pages of data. Picture the day when every light pole on every street is festooned with CCTV cameras and with infrared motion sensors that can see through the walls of your house. Imagine when everyone's DNA is forcibly collected, something on which the Supreme Court has just now cracked the door open. RFID <laughs> tags may be required of all employed persons to monitor their whereabouts. Bumblebee-sized surveillance drones will swarm everywhere. Now ask yourselves, could such a society dispense with death squads, beatings in detention cells, and all the other stigmata of violently repressive police states and still be a highly coercive and totalitarian society? When governments view the people not as citizens, but as criminal suspects, it is the opposite of social peace, regardless of the crime rate or any presence of judicial or extrajudicial killings there would exist a permanent state of war of government against people. That may seem like speculation far from the immediate subject of this report, which is about the scourge of both individual and state organized violence, but I believe we must think more creatively about what a society at peace ought to look like and how we get there. For it is hollow progress if mitigation of physical violence is achieved by Orwellian techniques that injure the autonomy and dignity of human beings and which do so by slow and imperceptible degrees that make it difficult to assess until it is too late. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Um, and I'd like to have uh, Sean Carroll, who is a Senior Director of, um, of Cross-Functional and New Markets Group at Creative Associates. He's also the former Chief of Staff and Chief Operating Officer at USAID. Uh, he's a development professional who's uh, been in the field for about 25 years and has operated in 55 countries. Um, and it is uh, our pleasure to hear uh, Sean Carroll um, give some uh, brief comments. Thank Thanks. you, Dan. <clears throat> Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Michelle, for, for having me today. I almost didn't make it. My voice uh, may not make it. so I'll. I'll push ahead and see how we do. Um, thank you and congrats uh, to the Institute for Economics and Peace on this um, 2013 Global Peace Index and thank you to CSIS for hosting us. Um, I wanted to focus on youth and their peace in the peace, as it were. Um, half the world's under the age of 30. Uh, what's in the report is affected by them and of course is of utmost importance to them. And particularly focus on the fact there are 357 million uh, youth between the age of 15 and 24 who are, who are uh, what are sometimes affectionately referred to as NEETs, neither in education um, nor uh, employment nor any form of training. Um, so that's about one in three 15 to 24 year olds. Um, and violence and being out of school and out of work is a, is, is a vicious cycle that feeds on each other. <clears throat> I'd like to focus a little bit on Central America and look at where they sort of come out on the index here, but also what we're seeing in our work in, at Creative um, on crime and violence prevention and youth programming in four countries in, in Central America. Um, the Central American countries aren't in the top 10 or the bottom 10. They're sort of all in the middle with some, you know, some spread and, and some, some interesting spread that I'd like to comment on and maybe ask the, uh, the authors to comment on. Um, but there is, as you, point, as you pointed out, a focus on, on homicides and that the increase 
in the number of homicides up 8% over the last year is almost entirely contributed, uh, attributed to Southern Africa and to, and to Latin America. And with Honduras, as you've pointed out, going up, you know, 10 uh, homicides per 100,000 uh, uh, population, they're up to, to 92, and that's the highest in the world. Um, but several other countries in, in uh, Central America are close behind, El Salvador um, at 71. Uh, Guatemala's had a big drop off in the last few years, and I'll comment on that. Um, Panama and, and, uh, and Nicaragua much, uh, much lower, and there are some differences there. Michael Shifter, last year encountering criminal violence in Central America, of course, pointed out uh, what a lot of the reasons are. It's um, uh, one of geography sandwiched between the big drug producing countries and the largest drug consumer in the U.S. Um, remnants of, of civil wars, a lot of weapons and, and gunmen, high uh, rates of poverty, weak, underfunded, and sometimes uh, corrupt governments. And when we um, are looking at communities where we want to institute a youth program and open up a youth center, we now have 104 in four countries in Central America starting in 2006. We sort of see 13 risk factors. And some of them show up in the index, but others don't. And one of my questions to you would be, you know, should some more of these be reflected? I think particularly in the positive peace index, I, it, it, it looks much more uh, macro than it does macro. When I think about um, youth at the community level and what they're, the odds they're facing and the violence they're facing and what's needed um, to overcome that and to avoid those risks, I, I'm not sure that we see it all inside the index. You know, we see weak local government, that's certainly you have in there. Um, large number of kids, as I've mentioned, not in school or working, broken families. Um, poor quality education opportunities, lack of mentors and, 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 uh, and established uh, programs where they can um, have mentors, gangs and drugs, of course, um, bad infrastructure and, and inability to access opportunities that are outside their immediate um, community and their immediate um, uh, area. But we sort of see um, uh, kind of five buckets of development assets, and again, I would I would ask and I would challenge you to figure out a way to have some of these, um, these uh, opportunities or these needed development assets for youth to move into uh, positive adulthood and to avoid a life of crime and violence. And somehow, how can we get those, I, again, I would think, into the positive peace index? You know, these sort of five development assets are having a life plan, uh, being a change agent, um, using uh, free time constructively, uh, being committed to uh, education and continuing one's education and, and taking um, healthy, uh, making healthy uh, decisions. I'm going to just give you a few figures from what we've seen over time um, in the communities where we're working because it's, it's, it's pretty striking. Um, we started in, in Guatemala in 2006 in Honduras and we're, and, and we're out of Guatemala so those youth centers are continuing um, in a sustainable way with local government. Um, uh, municipal government, uh, uh, church uh, entities involved, um, and of course that's a hugely important that these these outreach centers where vulnerable youth who are subjected to violence and crime can go. It's hugely important that those are sustainable and those continue going. So as I mentioned in, in Guatemala, though Creative and USAID, which has funded this programming, is not active in this anymore. The, the youth centers continue. We've been more recently in Panama, uh, Honduras, and. Uh, and uh, in El Salvador, and again, if you look at the uh, at the murder rate, Central America as a region is um, is fourth, amazingly, in absolute numbers, is fourth in the world. You know, behind only Southern Asia and South America and, and Eastern Africa, but it's second in terms of its rate per hundred thousand. Um, and again, we mentioned specifically the high rates of of uh, Honduras and 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 Salvador. Uh, dropped somewhat in the last few, few years in Guatemala and then lower in Nicaragua and Panama. Um, one thing that's happening in Central America, and it would be interesting to see how this shows up, is how the governments are changing, changing their plans um, from a hard uh, iron-fisted um, uh, to more prevention. And we heard one uh, police chief in San Pedro Sula, which is the murder capital of the world, uh, say, you know, prevention, we've, we've got to be passionately involved in prevention, it's the only way. Uh, another police official saying, you know, we saw one youth center open and we saw the crime rate drop and at first we thought, well, that's interesting. And then we saw another, another youth center 
in another part of town and the crime rate dropped there and we thought, hmm, extremely interesting. By the third one, he believed there was really um, some causality here. Um, in, in Panama from 2011 to 2013, the perception among the communities where the program is act, uh, active, perception of security went up 60, uh, sorry, 24 um, percent. In, in Colón, where we also have centers, it went from 24 percent up to 68 percent of the population feeling uh, more secure. Um, and the number of homicides in Panama dropped uh, from 2009 to 2013, uh, 26 percent. Um, you're seeing it, uh, let me just give last, uh, some last figures here, in three communities in, in El Salvador, in Santa Ana, which is the largest of these three, the crime rate has remained steady. It even went out, dropped from 2009 to 2010, and then went up again in 2011, about back to the level of 2009. But where we have our youth community centers, where there's a place, a safe place for youth to go, it's uh, dropped by a third. Um, in Chalchuapa, where we have much broader coverage, it's gone from 67 homicides um, uh, and 67 in 2010 down to 38. Uh, so it's almost half there. And El, in El Congo, similarly, it's gone down about 50%. So, you know, we're seeing there can be a great effect when uh, youth actually have uh, a way to avoid these risk factors and getting them into crime and violence. Um, I think it's going to take some time and probably it's going to take um, more coverage. Our, uh, the cost for a youth in our program is about $70 per year in Panama, but incarceration is $17,000 um, a year. So, and it's a fairly large uh, program, but you realize it's not lar nearly large enough. You go back to the one in three 15 to 24 year olds around the world out of work and out of school and you realize you need a lot more um, uh, 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 provision of development assets through youth centers, through programming, uh, through opportunities and activities which move youth into, into positive adulthood. Um, I think it'll take time and it'll take more uh, of these kinds of prevention programs led by governments, led by donors, led by um, uh, local uh, entities that are providing the services and the programs. Um, but it would be interesting to see um, how or if um, these issues of crime and violence at the local level and youth being both perpetrators of and victims of it uh, could show up more in these indices. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, John. Um, Melanie Greenberg is president and CEO of the Alliance for Peace Building, um, and she's formerly the president and founder of the Cyprus Fund for Peace and Security. She's a, a longtime player in the, uh, the conflict, post-conflict peace building and nuclear non-proliferation worlds, um, and it's uh, our pleasure to, uh, to um, hear your comments as well. Thanks. Well, thank you very much, Bob, and to Michelle and Daniel for just a magnificent report, and it's just a, a great pleasure to be here. Uh, when Michelle said we are moving away from a utopian narrative of peace, I'm not sure she imagined we would have this, I would say it goes beyond an Orwellian vision. I think we're heading into the total recall category, but it does make us think very hard about the nature of peace and the nature of violence. And one comment I'd like to make just at the very beginning before I move on to other remarks is that the peace building community, I don't think has done a very good job about getting our arms around criminal violence and the kinds of regional and external forces that are driving violence and homicide in so much of the world. And so I think the Global Peace Index in its focusing on those and in our, our discussions today has really done us a service and that we as a peace building community need to move forward on that. But it's hard to believe that it's only been six years since the Global in Peace Index was first presented. Uh, it has become such a touchstone of our field and I find even in my own consciousness that when I read a story about, for example, the riots recently outside Stockholm, I find myself secretly wondering if Sweden is going to go down in the Global Peace Index this year. So it's, it's really just, just wonderful work and we're very grateful in our community. So you're giving us these very tangible uh, numbers and stories and narratives that we can use in our own work. So one of the most interesting things that I think I find every year in the Global Peace Index is the stories that it tells about different kinds of states, different trends, 
How do we see the Arab Spring playing out in these numbers? How do we think about wealthy Scandinavian countries versus countries that are struggling in a post-conflict setting in other places in the world? One of the most interesting stories to emerge this year, and at a very special time in the international global policy process, are around fragile states. These are states that have very high rates of violence. Uh, 1.5 billion people live in conflict and conflict affected and fragile states. A very, very small number of them, if any, has reached a single millennium development goal. And if you scratch not very far below the surface, you see real tales of human suffering, of hopes being dashed, of an inability to have a future for their children that people want. So, so thinking about fragile states and what these numbers tell us about them is important um, for, for many, many reasons. Um, but if you look at the bottom 10 of the Global Peace Index, you'll see that five of those are members of the G7 Plus, a self-proclaimed group of fragile states. So Afghanistan, Somalia, Sudan, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, and Central African Republic. So what does this tell us about the nature of peace and development and the need to be thinking about peace and development in harmony? People often talk about, develop, as, about conflict as being development in reverse. It's impossible to build institutions and to move out of fragility towards what the positive peace index would, would tell us as resilience when conflict is raging. But it's a chicken and egg kind of problem because without the kind of institutions and opportunities that development presents, it's so easy to slide back into conflict. So how do we move further down that scatter map and shorten the arrows that, that Daniel was telling us about? So I'd like to talk about two glimmers of hope in that process that are happening right now as we speak in the global community. And the first is for those of you who follow the post-2015 process, what will be replacing the Millennium Development Goals. The high-level panel that was appointed, appointed by Secretary Ban Ki-moon of the United Nations to map out a course for what the post-2015 development framework will look like issued their long-awaited report last week. And we in the peacebuilding community were really delighted because out of the five central themes that the report highlighted, one of them was dedicated to peace. And it wasn't peace in a namby-pamby kind of utopian way. It was saying that peace is not only um, an integral part of development, but a necessary goal for all people, something for us all to aspire to. So this gave us a lot of hope that as we move through the post-2015 process, that peace will not be left as part of the Millennium Declaration as it was in 2000, but will really be a robust goal and integrated throughout all of the other goals in the high-level panel. Now, in many ways, this is not surprising that if you look at the makeup of the high-level panel, it included David Cameron from the UK, who's long been a, a proponent of mixing peace building and development. John Podesta here from the Center for American Progress, very strong American voice for these issues. Ellen Johnson Sirleaf, the president of Liberia, whose own country has been a pioneer in blending peace building and development. And Amelia Perez, who, the finance minister of Timor-Leste, who is one of the co-chairs of the International Dialogue on Peace Building and State Building, which I'll get to later. So peace emerged as a goal. It was universal, which means that it's not only for Sierra Leone and Afghanistan and DRC, but for the United States and Sweden and Finland, that all countries must reach towards peace and towards the indicators of peace uh, for this to be a successful goal. But I think equally interesting was what happens when you move below the principles level. When you start looking at the actual goals and targets set out in the high-level panel, they start to look very much like the pillars of peace that are outlined in the positive peace index, which you can find on page 77 and further in the global peace index this year. And what this report is saying and what the post-2015 framework will look like is that in order for sustainable development to take hold, you need to focus on security, that security forces be professional, accessible, and respectful of human rights, that there be equal access to justice, that all citizens be able to access judicial processes to gain redress for wrongs in their societies, that violence against women and children is eliminated, that jobs are provided so that in the, what was the acronym, the NEETS, yeah. that, in that in that framework that people can graduate from school and move on to jobs and be productive members of the economy rather than taking up arms. 
And most important, that legitimate governance is the basis for all development, that civil society and citizens need to have participation in their own governments and to start forming those institutions that Daniel mentioned takes so long, but you need to start somewhere, that even if it's democratic with a small d, that civil society and civilians have a stake in their own government and how they're governed. So we as the Alliance for Peace Building, along with the Institute for Economics and Peace, are working hard to make sure that there's civil society for support for this framework of peace building within the, um, what will replace the high-level panel, will move into an open working group and eventually the adoption at the General Assembly of the United Nations of the post-2015. But another highlight and a process that really informed the high-level panel was something called the New Deal for Engagement in Fragile States. And I won't go into great detail except to say that it's an innovative development process that operates around peace building and state building goals, recognizing that peace building and development need to go hand in hand. And if you look at the peace building and state building goals, they look like the pillars of peace. It's all around jobs, legitimate governance, um, accessible security, human rights. Um, eight of the pilot countries of the New Deal are represented in the bottom 10 of the Global Peace Index. But what the high-level panel, uh, I'm sorry, what the New Deal seeks to do uh, is to help each country map its way out of fragility in its own way with the support of donors and a very robust international and domestic civil society participation. It answers the question of the slowness of the development of institutions. This is trying to fast track the kind of institutional development that will eventually lead to peace. It helps us understand how to measure peace, and Camille Shippa from the Institute for Economics and Peace has been very engaged. And how do you develop indicators to measure things like civil society engagement? It's very difficult, and especially when you get to issues of perceptual data, of how, you know, for example, women uh, see violence against them. Well, there might be a decline in the number of rapes reported. It might not be because there are fewer rapes. It might be because women don't feel safe enough to report them. So how do you integrate that perceptual and formal kind of data into more of the formal processes that we, that we have now? And how do we start to link better development assistance with peace building goals in these countries so that development is really effective and that, over, that official development assistance is not wasted? So I think I'll stop there and say that the Global Peace Index gives us the raw data and a sense of trends that we need in these very complex international processes and we'll really look forward to working with you to make some of the, the dreams that you have for your work uh, take, take hold in the international environment. Thanks very much, Melanie. Um, before we turn to uh, audience question and answer session, I'd like to ask um, uh, Michelle and, Dan and uh, Daniel to respond uh, briefly to some of the comments made by the discussants. Um, while they're speaking, I'd like to invite those of you who are watching uh, the live webcast, either through the CSIS website or through the Hive, um, to send any questions that you might have for the Q&A to my email address at rdlamb at csis.org. And I will, um, I'll choose some of those questions as well if, um, if they're compelling enough. Um, so I'd like to have uh, Michelle and uh, Daniel just respond very briefly, and then we'll turn to the audience Q&A. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. Uh, and thank you, everyone, on the panel for your comments. Uh, I think I'll just very quickly address what you were talking about, Sean, uh, about uh, youth development and the need to have youth development metrics in the positive peace framework and, and certainly an important thing that we think about when we think about drivers of violence. Um, one thing that uh, IEP, Institute for Economics and Peace, has been working on uh, in conjunction with the Commonwealth Secretariat is a youth development index um, and we've become very familiar with uh, the sorts of data problems that one runs into when you try and get disaggregated uh, data for youth, you know, 15 to 24 or 15 to 29. Uh, and the, 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 the difficulties there really are quite significant. Um, I'll just take one example. If, if we wanted to measure uh, the level of youth unemployment at the national level, uh, if we take the example of Sierra Leone, uh, UN statistics might report that the youth unemployment rate is 7%, so that would put it in one of the, one, one of the best countries in the world for youth uh, unemployment. You then go to uh, NGOs working on the ground in Sierra Leone and they say, well, it's actually 70%, which would make it one of the worst in the world. 
You then go to another source and you, you look at the African Development Bank and they say, well, it's about 36%. So the, the data difficulties around youth-specific issues is, is really quite uh, significant. And I think, uh, Sean, of course, the point that prevention uh, against violence is, is obviously the critical thing. Uh, we, we know the human capital loss of incarcerating young people is, is devastating and uh, we really should be working towards prevention rather than incarceration. The cost benefit just doesn't really work. Um, Michelle, did you want to respond to any of the other comments on the panel or? I think you should comment about the fear of violence. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, I, I was going to say, uh, Melanie, um, it's a very unhealthy uh, obsession to start thinking about uh, what happens in Sweden, and then I wonder what, what will happen to the GPI score. I find myself doing the same thing. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, certainly, one, one thing that uh, this work is directed towards at the moment is what is going on at the UN and in the post-2015 process. Uh, they, they have identified that peace is, is going to be a, a critical pillar, uh, but I think one of the key issues will certainly be not only just measuring violence, uh, but also measuring the drivers of violence. And that's, that's where that, that debate will be, I think, quite tricky. Uh, and certainly, uh, the need to develop better data is, is a, a recurrent theme. Uh, it's, it's something that we, we really can't measure these things unless we get better information on, on what's actually happening. I think um, I just wanted to add as sort of a final point is that while we do present the global peace index and the positive peace index separately, what we're really trying to do between those two measures and the combination of violence containment spending is to present a more holistic view of the measurement of peace and security in people's lives, but also in our communities. So while we say this is the level of violence and this is where we see the institutional capacity, we don't advocate for a complete elimination of violence containment or violence containment spending. And so we hope to say that there should be a recognition of a balance that we need to identify in a society between rule of law, violence containment, numbers of police, levels of incarceration, and also those certain structures and attitudes and institutions that will help sustain that and then eventually will hopefully help reduce the need for so much violence containment spending. And while we don't have this perfect balance or perfect number, that's the kind of framework that we're trying to work towards. Uh, thank you very much. Um, if you have a question, I would like to request that you raise your hand, um, identify yourself um, and your affiliation, um, and uh, state your question in the form of a question. Please keep it brief. We will have a lot of questions. Um, please keep your question um, brief um, and focused um, as much as possible on the, uh, on the Global Peace Index. I'm going to make uh, uh, one minor exception uh, to that because um, I'm going to ask Paula Bryan, uh, who's Vice President of Policy and Campaigns at Oxfam, uh, to ask the first question, um, and I will let him um, uh, offer a couple of comments uh, before asking his question. Uh, he was supposed to be one of the speakers up here, but he had a conflict for the early part, so we, um, uh, we figured that we'd uh, just have you give the first comment. Thanks very much. Thanks, Robert. Well, I won't go on too long, but it's been really fascinating to hear what I've heard, and I'm sorry I missed the beginning of it. Um, I, I, found, I thought it was fascinating. Uh, I was a little depressed to read that, uh, having just gone from being an Irish citizen to being an American citizen, that large countries don't do so well. Uh, but apparently I can't take that back, and I don't really want to. Um, uh, here's the, I want to engage you both, if I could, uh, Michelle and Daniel, in a thought experiment. I'm sure many others will love the, the report, but let's say it got a lot of political traction in this town. And let's say that somebody explicitly made the connection between President Obama's pledge in the State of the Union to end extreme poverty and your use of, the, uh, of this indicator to map out where peace uh, and poverty perhaps are connected in the more holistic way that you're talking about. 
Because I think what many people are saying is, if we're going to actually reach President Obama's goal, well, China's actually taking care of a lot of the extreme poor, and so will India. But fragile states, as Melanie said, we don't have that answer. So I think a lot of us are going to be much more focused on this. And so you're ahead of the game, is my view, and that would be another reason people should read the report. But my, here's my thought experiment question. What would the US government, if that was true, what would the US government be investing a lot more in and what would it be investing a lot less in? What institutions would probably profit from everybody taking your index more seriously and which ones would probably not be so thrilled? Um, and I, actually, no, let me just leave it there. So who's gonna be the winner and who's gonna be the loser if this gets more traction? Thanks, Paul. Um, tricky question. Uh, we, we tend to shy away from these sorts of policy questions, but I think one thing that the, the, the economic costing exercise and, and the research does demonstrate uh, is the fact that development is synonymous with security in a lot of these fragile states. So uh, while the tendency may be to think uh, military spending is the best way to do that, uh, some of this research would imply that investment in development is actually a very good way of boosting security, global security. And I think if you look at, you know, to get uh, more specific, I think uh, last year we, we looked at uh, violence containment spending in the United States, the amount of money that the United States economy spends on containing and dealing with the consequences of violence. Uh, the federal budget uh, has a significant portion of it, and Mike can probably talk about this as well, uh, committed to military spending, uh, but also to uh, homeland security, to incarceration, to police. Uh, those, those sorts of expenditures are fundamentally unproductive. Um, and the, the implication is, is if you can reduce your violence containment spending and transfer that money into other areas uh, that are potentially more economically productive, but also uh, you know, can be transferred into development, uh, then that would be a far more productive way to, to spend uh, time and money. Uh, so I don't know if that answers the question, but... Could I just add for about 15 seconds? Uh, part of the problem is that when you see the privatization of things like prisons, uh, it changes the equation because a social cost becomes somebody's shareholder value and the constituency becomes much louder and much more difficult to deal with. Okay, I'd like to invite again the, uh, the internet to send uh, uh, questions to rdlamb at, um, at csis.org. Um, so far, the humans in the room are outpacing you. Um, uh, so let's see, let's, um, let's start um, here in the front. And just wait for the microphone, please, if you would. Thank you. My name is Carol Spence. I'm with the Peace Alliance. My husband and I, John, are um, Virginia representatives for the Peace Alliance. My question is, um, have there been any figures done on the drug trafficking trade and the murders? And um, what percentage of murders do we see uh, that are impacted from drug tra trafficking? Uh, in our Thanks for the question. In our data, we, we don't disaggregate drug-related uh, homicides. Uh, to, I just to what the had on certainly, uh, certainly, when you look at uh, when you look at Mexico, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, a, a lot of the those high homicide rates that we're talking about, and Sean alluded to it, is related to drug crime, the drug war. Uh, you know, Mexico had, as Michelle pointed out in her presentation, uh, 25,000 conflict deaths last year. Uh, that's, that's almost as much as a country like Libya that had 30,000 in a full-blown civil war. Uh, so the, the number of deaths from drug-related violence is, is very significant. Um, in terms of getting exact figures, uh, I'm not aware of any. It, it, it's a very difficult task, but it's certainly a very huge part of violent deaths in Central America, especially. A uh, question in the back, please. 
Hi, thank you. Um, my name is Karen Volker, and I'm with Cure Violence. And my question relates to, um, based on your analysis, how important is it to decrease violence in order to make progress on the pillars of peace? And how does your, the level of violence impact or affect your answer? If you look at the the, the, the relationship between peace and posi uh, between violence and positive peace, it, it really is quite a clear association. As you lower violence, uh, institutions can can develop and recover, uh, and uh, violence is an interrupter of many of those uh, core institutions. Uh, so it, there very much is a, a direct uh, relationship. Um, as I said in the presentation, though, it is going to depend. Uh, on the type of violence we're talking about and the mix of institutions in a specific country. Uh, that's as about as detailed as I can give it in a generalized way. It will depend on the, the country context and the circumstances of that, that country. Okay, the internet is catching up with the live bodies. We have a question from Carolyn Baxter um, at the Rand Corporation, um, uh, which I will uh, rephrase and elaborate because it's uh, along the lines of a question that I have as well. Um, in, uh, in your presentation and your report, you found um, a, a fairly low correlation between official development assistance and improvements. In, um, in peace. Uh, this is actually fairly consistent with other research uh, that's found that low, low income, uh, fragile and conflict affected countries um, up until 2011 had not really, had not achieved any of the Millennium Development Goals. They, there have, some of those goals have been achieved in about 20 of those countries since then. Um, but that's still not a particularly impressive <laughs> showing um, for, for the international development community's efforts to, um, to improve on peacefulness and other development outcomes in, in the sorts of countries we're talking about here. Um, but uh, beyond the general observation that ODA is, is, um, is generally um, uh, not very effective in these areas, um, clearly there are some efforts that are effective, um, more effective than others. Um, and um, Carolyn says that uh, in some of her research uh, that non-material aid um, on issues like uh, education and law, enfor uh, law enforcement do tend to be somewhat more effective uh, than uh, uh, material aid. Um, and uh, so I'd like to uh, pose that question to um, actually everybody on the panel because you all have um, you all have perspectives on this question, um, and to comment more generally on um, how how can the official uh, development assistance community uh, do a better job um, in in uh, conflict affected, fragile, and violent countries. Melanie looks like she wants to answer. Good. Thank you. Looking from a civil society perspective, there is a wonderful book that came out recently called Time to Listen by Dana Brown at, at CDA uh, Learning, Collaborative Learning Projects that interviewed thousands of people around the world on their perspectives on receiving aid. And what most of them said was, first of all, aid is often ineffective when it strictly goes through governments, when governments are not um, interviewing their own citizens about what would be most effective. So official aid comes in, it can swamp economically swamp a region, inflate prices, sometimes create more harm than good in these very fragile environments. And if civil society were consulted and there were a process where individual communities could decide what were their needs, how to build institutions their way, that could go a long way towards increasing the effectiveness. And that's what's being tried right now through the New Deal. Uh, I, and what I would emphasize is that uh, as of 2011, there has been quite a lot of progress. Uh, the, the fact that the that there have been 20 fragile states that will meet at least one goal uh, and several more that will very likely meet another goal. Uh, that's, that's good news. Um, I think the other thing to emphasize is that foreign direct investment is now a very big uh, part of development in, in these places. Uh, foreign FDIs uh, outweigh ODAs in, in many contexts. So it's not just about ODAs. Um, 
Um, and I, I'd like to, uh, I'll take this opportunity to, uh, um, to press a, a, a series of reports that my program is, is in the process of publishing on absorptive capacity. Um, we have a couple of copies of the report out there. And one of the things we found that was that the issue of um, aid effectiveness um, when obstacles are found on, on aid in, in fragile and conflict-affected countries is that um, uh, it's often treated as a technical issue, uh, that, that technical capacity building can solve the problem. But in our research, we found that it um, actually has a lot more to do uh, at least as much to do with the political economy of the recipient country um, at the you know local and sectoral levels, as well as with uh, the the donor's own capacity to deliver to deliver on its promises, um, which turns out to be significantly lower than I think all of us um, optimistically believe. Further questions um, in the front here, please. Yes. If you, right. Wait for the microphone, please. Thanks. Good afternoon, Andrew Smith. I'm an independent researcher from Australia. Good to hear another Aussie accent too. I understood everything you said. Uh, my, my question uh, relates to the, the Cartesian distribution where you plotted GPI against PPI figures too. Uh, the observation I'd make is I was struck by how similar that is to a uh, distribution that Dr. Tony Murney did from Australia did in some work where he was plotting a range of indices against rule of law score for countries. And in fact, the distribution just intuitively is almost identical uh, in terms of shape. I'd need to look at it in more detail to see if countries are in the same places. Intuitively, I suspect they would be. Perhaps the thing that is, is most striking about it, and this is the point that Tony makes, is that there are really no outright outliers. Virtually every country is somewhere along the medium uh, diagonal. There's, there's a few that are a bit further away, but there are none that have a very high value uh, on one particular index and a low one on the other. Um, uh, and perhaps the significance of that is, and it supports perhaps some of the pessimism we might have about how we fix things, is that uh, there are no quick fixes. You just can't fix one thing and then suddenly see a rapid increase in, say, GPI or something like that. Um, that more likely what you'll see as countries progress up and down the mean diagonal is a more agonising sort of two steps forward, one step back type uh, process uh, and the remainder of the international community that for its own reasons is trying to improve that is going to have the patience and the endurance uh, to keep ploughing in the resources to enable countries to move. From your observation of countries that have moved up and down the diagonal, is that what you are seeing or are, are there any indications of optimistic quick fixes? Daniel agrees with everything you just said. <laughs> and I understood it very clearly. Uh, um, thanks for the question, it's interesting. Uh, when we look at the, the PPI uh, versus GPI, there actually are quite a lot of outliers. Um, well, outliers in the sense that, uh, for instance, if you look above the red line, uh, yeah, Laos and Sierra Leone have relatively low levels of violence, but, uh, well, relatively high levels uh, of peace, but uh, low levels of uh, institutional capacity and uh, what we what you see when you track it over time or at least in the last 10 years is those countries tend to go back towards the red line so that's sort of what that shows there so when you have that uh, difference between you know that sort of enforced peace and low capacity that's just one observation I think it requires a lot more research that when you look at the pillars uh, there are actually quite a lot of uh, differences between pillars. Uh, so on page 83 of the report, uh, uh, you can see that uh, you know, some countries do very well in, in some areas and very badly in others. Uh, so there, there are some slight yeah, differences uh, in terms of the, the, the pillars. So uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure uh, about Tony Mooney's work, but it would be interesting to certainly have a look at it and maybe I can, we can have a bit of a chat later on. Uh, let's get a question from the very center here. Thank you very much. I'm Ed Amandar for World Bank Retiree. I inquire whether there might be some methodological bias in the report against large countries and countries that have particularly active international security engagements, including above all the United States, maybe the, the uh, P5 in the UN Security Council and the like. And I wonder about the treatment of military expenditures uh, internationally and particularly on peacekeeping, which might be considered a global public good, 
but then it's also a military expenditure which may come out in a negative way in this analysis. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks. It's, it's an important question. Um, the militarization or the external indicators of the index have a lower weighting for one. They, they, they weighted 40% as opposed to 60 for the internal. Uh, and the uh, militarization indicators, uh, the really key ones, so for, for instance, if we're looking at uh, the level of uh, military expenditure, uh, they, they're banded between countries that are extremely high and, and the norm. So the rationale is uh, the United States, which spends about 4.6% of GDP on military spending, uh, only scores about a 2 out of 5, 2.5 out of 5 on the military expenditure indicator. Uh, that's because country like North Korea, it's being compared to a country like North Korea, which is spending an enormous amount of its GDP on, on military expenditure. So when you actually look at the scores, it's not necessarily the case that those big countries get punished for their military expenditure. Uh, the other thing is, is uh, UN peacekeeping is a positive indicator within the GPI. So uh, if countries meet their UN peacekeeping commitments, they get a better score. So, uh, and so we, we do try and account for that. Uh, one, step up to a microphone, yeah. if you would. Hi, I'm Jamie Morgan with the Economist Intelligence Unit. I would just also add to that, I don't know where the person is who asked the question, but <laughs> um, we do within the armed services and several of the other military force indicators take it as a share of 100,000 people. So it is. Um, adjusted basically for the size of the population. And then on top of that, interestingly, this year was the first year since 1998 that the United States has dropped in military spending as a share of GDP. And actually the overall global rise, oh, sorry. Um, the overall global rise in that indicator of military spending as a share of GDP actually comes from um, low and middle income countries that uh, are spending a much larger share of their um, their economy. Thanks, good question. Um, also in the middle here. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> uh, my name is Angela Kirkman. I'm uh, from Conservation International and uh, from our newly formed Center for Environment and Peace. And so I'd like to pick on some of the comments we heard about um, the drivers of violence and conflict and um, the fact that investment in development um, may be a more effective way to improve security um, than spending on military uh, measures. And I guess I would like to suggest sort of going one step further and saying that um, the investment needs to be in sustainable development, and that sort of picks up on some of the Millennium uh, Development Goals. Um, and I guess the question I had is about um, measures for environment um, and sustainable development actually in the scoring index. Um, I had a quick look at this and I couldn't see anything explicit. Um, so I'm just wondering if somebody can comment on um, the um, direct link of, say, the state and access to critical natural resources such as fresh water and how that could be um, addressed in the scoring index um, maybe going forward. Thanks for your question. Uh, in the positive peace index, uh, there are no uh, metrics related to environmental sustainable development. Uh, one of the reasons is is because uh, we empirically derived that with the GPI, and uh, there is not a strong empirical association when when you compile the data that is available. Uh, and we have to bear in mind these exercises are conditioned by the data that's available and. Uh, that's certainly something that, you know, there is the Environmental Sustainability Index that uh, Yale University does that tries to quantify these things. Uh, but these efforts are, uh, are few and far between, and uh, that's really one of the difficulties going forward. And uh, certainly it's an issue that has been raised by the high-level panel in the post-2015 process that this is something that needs to be better measured. Um, so perhaps when we get those better measures, we can better understand them. Again, I'd like to invite those of you watching the live webcast to email your questions to rdlamb at csis.org. Uh, question right here, please. 
Um, my name is Simin, um, Simin Wahdat, and I'm um, working with Democracy International right now. So my, my question is, um, how would you incorporate the tension around religious conflicts and especially the rise of radicalization uh, in UK and US? So do you think these issues will impact the development, Millennium Development Goal in the future, or do you have any remarks about that? <laughs> Hi, uh, that's a good question. So we actually have a terror activity indicator um, within the index, which does draw upon an internationally respected, um, there are several, but it draws upon one in particular terrorism database that incorporates into it not only um, acts of terror, but also the, as was mentioned earlier, the number of fatalities and injuries um, and property. And it does also weight through the measurement. Um, it does make an effort to also account for the psychological impacts of terrorism. So within that respect, it is accounted for, but the larger question, I think, of religious-based um, violence. I'll kind of defer to other, the people who are involved in the construction to talk a bit about how that could be incorporated. No, thank you, Jamie. Um, yes, we do uh, look at this in our Global Terrorism Index, uh, and the data that that's based on is uh, put together by the University of Maryland, uh, and they actually code uh, terrorist incidents by their ideological objectives, uh, and religious terrorism is, is one of those one of those things that they code. Um, but I would say that, yeah, this type of violence is manifested in many different ways, uh, and it's difficult to get a hold of it within the, the GPI. Uh, but certainly I'd encourage you to look at the, the terrorism index that, that we put together to, to, to understand that. Would you like to add something, Melanie? Within the MDG process, at least in the discussions I've been having, the issue of religious extremism isn't mentioned by itself, but there are proxies for it. So it's looking at um, human rights, a full expression of religion and other personal beliefs, and so with the hope that perhaps would keep people from becoming more extreme. Looking at social cohesion and ways of bolstering that, again, to help bring people into the fold rather than driving them towards more extreme positions. So I think it's, it's coming indirectly. Okay. Um, question up front here, please. Hi, I'm Eli McCarthy with Georgetown University. Thank you very much for the report. Um, the question is, uh, I guess, about the positive peace index. To what extent were were you able to look at restorative justice programs? Um, I see the notion, the rule of law in the government indicator. Um, did you try to get into how much restorative justice is happening in court systems or schools in a particular state? And kind of related to that is this discussion about UN peacekeeping as a positive indicator. There's a, a pattern of sort of sexual assaults and rapes that have occurred in Congo, Haiti, et cetera, by peacekeepers. So maybe you could say a little more of the rationale of why that would be a positive indicator. Thanks. Thanks for your question. Uh, to the first part about restorative justice, uh, no, uh, we don't. Um, and the reason is is not because we don't want to, it's because uh, there, we, there is not a data source that, that comprehensively measures that at a, at a global level. Uh, one, the challenge of doing this when you're comparing nation states is you want to compare apples with apples. Um, and I, you know, I'd be interested uh, in what Alejandro has to say about this, just related to his rule of law uh, work, and he may have a better uh, handle on the kinds of information that's available in, on that specific area. Um, in terms of UN peacekeeping, it, 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 it's a point well taken. Uh, one thing that we, we, we are important, or it's important to note is that we, we don't count every UN peacekeeping mission. Uh, we only count the ones that, that are genuine peacekeeping missions. There, there's, there's several ways of looking at this. Um, and I can show you the missions that we actually count uh, afterwards if you want to get more detail. Uh, but it's, it's not every single UN uh, mission. 
just just very quickly, just uh, commenting on, on the restorative justice. Uh, there are basically almost no databases on on, on that. What uh, we have collected information, from instance, on the um, on the work of the civil justice systems around the world in about 100 countries, just measuring basically accessibility, efficiency, effectiveness, impartiality, but just on the degree of of actually redressing the issues. Uh, it's, it's, it's very complicated to measure actually that. We have even tried to, to measure the, the, the role of uh, traditional justice in, in different countries. Even the goals of the justice systems around the world are very different. Not in all of them are necessarily redressing uh, issues. So, so it's, it's, it's a very, very uh, complicated issue. Sorry, just one other thing with the UN peacekeeping thing to note is that we are measuring financial commitments. Uh, so the idea behind it is is the fact that it's the, the commitment of a nation state to the idea of UN peacekeeping. It's it's not directly related to uh, you know whether or not X country supports X mission, um, although we do have that data, um, and you can look at it. Okay. And clearly, for on projects like this, um, are entirely dependent upon the availability and the quality of the data, and I suspect that if, if one could come up with an index of data quality and completeness, um, that there would be a, a pretty strong correlation between level of peacefulness and quality of institutions and the quality of, of data. Um, and this is a, a fundamental challenge in um, uh, in everything. It's probably one of the main sources of the, of the criticisms that you guys get on a regular basis um, every time you, uh, you know, re release a report. And it's a fundamental challenge in our entire field. Um, the the um, A big part of the problem is that the data is available um, at the country year level, um, but in fragile states, these are not coherent um, societies. They're, you know, in, in many cases, their borders are drawn by departing colonists um, and clumping together people who don't want to be together and dividing people who do. And as a consequence, you, you don't have uniformity um, within the country, much less access in conflict zones to really um, easily collect the data. And so it's a fundamental challenge that all of us in this field face um, is the quality and availability of data. Um, let's just take a, a couple of more questions um, and uh, one final chance to, uh, to the internet um, who's clearly slacking off here. Um, RDLAMB at CSIS.org. Um, let's take uh, just, uh, we'll take two final questions um, right here and then um, over there in the back. Hi. Uh, Cameron Crail with the Institute for Policy Studies. Um, the report had briefly mentioned a uh, prospective long-term project uh, regarding the quantification of uh, crime expenditure, uh, which would use data derived from uh, personal injury, property damage, and uh, preventative measures like uh, surveillance uh, insurance. And I was just wondering what the current status of that project is. That something that's underway currently, or uh, something that's more of a goal for the future? Um, and let's take the, uh, the the next. Actually, uh, while the microphone is going over there, it's probably a pretty quick question to answer. <laughs> yes, uh, we are we are working on it. Uh, we're working on a project in uh, Germany at the moment to try and count up the cost of violence containment expenditures there in a big European economy, uh, and we hope to do this for many other countries uh, so we can compare. Yeah. The final question. Hi, uh, Bernie Lee from Seton Hall University. I'm currently uh, spending my summer with the Department of Commerce. It seems that uh, um, in the positive peace index, a number of the OECD countries were uh, pre prevalent in that, and that we and when you look at a, no a number of these other things, you can conflate it with. Um, a, a number of economic issues. And when we talked about there's very little correlation with ODA and, um, and, and peace, I was wondering, do we need to reframe the welfare issue? Because it seems that there might be a stigma in that um, foreign, foreign direct investment or these states coming in, putting in money, look at these states poorly, do not put in the institute, do not work towards putting the inf institutions in to the people and maybe retraining the workforce and changing the culture in a way that allows them to accept a sort of uh, development assistance in a way that they, they're allowed to, I suppose, keep a little bit of national pride and actually take it, um, ownership of the projects. Okay. Um, what I'll ask is, uh, um, um, if uh, whoever would like to respond to that, to respond to it, but then also um, just give some final thoughts on um, the basic question of, so what? Given all of this, a lot of data, a lot of interesting trends, so what? Final thoughts, and uh, let's take it in. Um, let's take it in reverse order, starting with Jamie, and then moving down to to Michelle. If there's anything you'd like to add. Well, 
Thank you. I guess in terms of so what, I'll just reiterate the call about data. Um, a lot of fa I manage several different indices at the EIU, and a lot of challenges we face is um, about data. A lot of people often ask, well, why didn't you include this or that factor? And usually comes down to data management. And it's not a very classy issue to fund at the development level, but it's really important. Melanie. And I would conclude by saying that too often people think that peace is a utopian venture, that there's no way to measure progress, so why should we fund it, why should we invest in it, and that the Global Peace Index and the this, this search for data to help us measure our effectiveness is just crucial for peace building to take hold and to be recognized as something concrete, effective, attainable, and something we can all aspire to. Thanks. Mike, final thoughts? Uh, more data do not always, and I say this as a longtime veteran of the Budget Committee, more data do not ensure objectivity and accuracy when the criteria themselves are inherently subjective. Two things. Obviously, the first thing when you come up with an index is, is, is countries are going to come up and say, okay, so what do we do? So obviously you must have a, a, a complete set of answers to, to that. <laughs> uh, and, and, and the second one, obviously, if the third part, the relationship between the, the Global Peace Index and the, and the Positive Peace Index, really is opening a Pandora's box. What you're doing is, 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 is massive, because the relationship between these two and just figuring out the relationship is a daunting task. So which, which I think it's, it's great to provide a framework, a framework to start probably raising the questions, because a lot of the different components in different countries may be different and so on. So, so I think it's, it's, it's great that, that you do it, but really it's, it's, it's an enormous task really to figure out the, the, the components and what works and what doesn't. And this question that we had from the beginning of, of a development, what comes first, development, peacekeeping, peace, et cetera, these are very difficult questions in which obviously we don't have a, a, an aggregate answer. It's really just taking the pieces, taking it case by case, seeing what works in each case, uh, and just taking this as a, as a route, as a guiding map, but just to, to, to take that task. Yeah, I, I, I think I would emphasize that this is just a starting point in terms of the research, and that's where this, the, the point about data is so important. Uh, we really can't improve on what we're doing until we get much better information. I think in terms of when we think about peace, uh, the thing, uh, the so what that I really like to emphasize is the fact that violence and the absence of violence and peace is something that's relevant for all countries. It is a universal goal. And that's why it's important that uh, it's been, this has been recognized in the high level panel. Um, it's something that it, it's very important in, in low income countries, middle income and, and high income countries. So. Uh, with that, I'd, I'd like to thank the panel as well for their comments and uh, thank everyone for coming along. It's, it's been a really great discussion. Michelle? Well, Daniel took my so what, um, but I'll just add to that because in my position, since I am working here in the U.S. and I'm talking to a lot more groups who are working on various aspects of these issues, we have done a U.S. peace index that looks at ranking states by internal indicators and it's just my experience, and I'll offer these anecdotes, that people who are working on the ground with issues of violence in their own communities have the same reactions to these tools as those who are working on global indicator development processes. And we've seen a lot of similar drivers of violence and drivers of peace that have significant relationships, both in the U.S. and at the global level, and there's also quite um, a fair amount of relevance, whether we're talking about a homicide in Chicago or a homicide in Central America, and the people who are working on that stuff every day do have the same reaction and are looking for tools and metrics that can help further their cause. So my so what is that I'll take this opportunity to shill and say that we continue to drive down to the local level as much as we can, given the data uh, limitations that have been addressed. Um, we are going to be doing a Mexico Peace Index soon, and hopefully as we continue this work, we'll have more answers. Thanks.
The um, uh, connecting data and research to, uh, to the policy world is what we do. Um, and uh, our program, I encourage you to visit c3.csis.org to see how, um, how we are trying to connect those issues. Um, the Global Peace Index, the Positive Peace Index, and the other, uh, and the other work that's been presented today can be found um, at economicsandpeace.org and visionofhumanity.org. I encourage you to visit those as well. Um, to those of you watching live via the internet, um, thank you for, uh, for watching and, uh, and participating. And to those of you who came today, Thanks for coming. I'd like to thank very much uh, all of our panelists and particularly the Institute for Economics and Peace um, for coming here today.